challenging, thought-provoking, insightful. This is God in Country, the collision of faith and politics, hosted by nationally known speaker, Reverend Dr. Sean Michael Greener. Not your typical Rev. Dr. Sean is a proud military veteran, former law enforcement officer, and founder of the internationally regarded executive protection team. Through counseling, elite life coaching, and national speaking, this ninja pastor tells it like it is. This series is biblically and politically engaged with the pedal to the metal. With today's edition of God in Country, here is host and author of the acclaimed yet controversial book, Excellence Killed the Church, How Mediocrity is Destroying America. Dr. Sean Michael Greener. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Man, is it great to have you guys. We so appreciate you joining us. It's going to be a very unique uh, message. I want to say hello to our folks in chat. We want to say hello to the Cahalan family. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Linda, so, so... uh, uh, it's just awesome to have you, and, and we continue to pray for you and the whole family, uh, absolutely, no doubt about it. Um, it's a privilege for us to pray for you. One thing I want to say uh, is, and, I, and I, I understand, if you think that i got to be making this up, if you think that I'm making this up, you need to come next Sunday at... I, I mean, this is not even a hook to try to get people to come. It's just for real. So good. So good. Tonight's dinner, I am officially listing, and it's official. It'll go in some book somewhere. Uh, tonight's meal was the best. It was absolutely astounding. Uh, my favorite thus far. I want to say hello to all of the folks listening all over the country, uh, from Maine to Florida, from uh Delaware, all the way out to California. Believe it or not, we do have people in California and Washington, Republic Washington, uh, Bremerton, Washington, other places like that. We have some folks listening from Canada. Thank you to the folks listening in Israel. Uh, I know it's super late for you guys, and it's awesome for you to listen. Last week, we had a whole group of people from Israel listen, and we're honored to have you listen. Uh, uh, it is just, uh, it's just amazing. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, so I want to do this, and uh, we don't normally do this, but I want to do this uh, as a special thing tonight. We're going to pray uh, for Carson Sellers. You guys know that we have been praying for Carson, uh, his grandparents at Tender Kehala, and, uh, his whole family, uh, Lacey and Cole, his twin, and his dad Jeff, and his mom Bryn. You probably... Uh, subscribe to brensellers.com. Um, you, um, you, you know the story uh, of Carson. And so Carson is, uh, I believe he is at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia right now, and he is, uh, there are some big decisions, very, very big decisions being made. Um, and so we're going to pray for that, and then we're going to get started. But thank you, for everyone, for listening. And if, as long as you're not driving, you know, um, I don't close my eyes when I'm standing and praying because I'll fall because of my brain injury. But uh, if you're somewhere where you can just get in a, a place of prayer, I sure would appreciate that. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to pray. We thank you that you listen and care. No matter how jacked up we are, uh, we listen. And you're, you are uh, amazing that you, that you listen to us, that you pay attention to us, that you care about us. And I'm, I'm awed by that. But we come to you especially tonight for Carson and the Sweet Sellers family all across the world that people are gathered together and agreeing with us and praying with us and people in homes are holding hands and we just uh, we are in agreement together that uh, the best decisions would be made. We know they're very serious decisions but we know how precious Carson is and his whole family uh, and you know his grandparents we dearly really love and we just really really uh, we really really are begging for your intervention in this case. Um, you have worked amazing things, maybe not the way that we had hoped for, but you've worked them, and uh, their family has taken note of it, and they've praised you throughout. And we ask that, that you work this out in your very best way. 
And uh, it is such an irony that we are praying this prayer tonight and preaching this sermon. Well, I thank you so much for every single person all around the world listening now. We pray that you bless them and that they would be uh, that they would be just uh, somehow or another comforted by the message tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to bring you our needs and our prayers. We thank you for the promise of heaven. We thank you that even though it's been four weeks since Chris is gone, hard to believe. It's it's just amazing. I still can't believe it. But at the same time, uh, four weeks in heaven beats four weeks anywhere else. Amen. And we thank you for that. And uh, we, we thank you for the opportunity to love somebody enough to miss them. Grief is the price of love. And we thank you that you taught us what true love is all about. Pray this in Yeshua, your son's name. This is a this is a different sort of sermon. So, I, and I understand if it freaks you out a little bit. And some some folks might have they might say, oh, sounds a little bit like last week's sermon, the sermon before that. But there's a piece of this that I noticed, and and I'll just tell you, I, I had an entirely different sermon prepared, completely different. And then I realized as I was ruminating. And as the, the questions and the comments were pouring in last week, people just commented and commented and commented. And, but they asked a lot of questions, and I love those questions. I absolutely love the questions, so keep them coming. Um, if you don't have our app on Android, it's free, and it's quick to download. It's also free on iPhone. If you have an iPhone, it takes less than a minute to download. That's really a cool thing. We have a desktop app, too. I would encourage you to get that. It's really, really awesome. But... If you had that, you can listen back to the last two weeks' uh, broadcast, and if you miss them after this, don't do it now, uh, but to get the context of what's going to happen tonight. If you don't listen to them now or you know before, if you didn't hear them before, it'll be okay, because what you're going to get is you're going to get a really cool revelation when you go back and listen to those. So I I wonder if you've ever wondered, why did Yeshua, or Jesus, still recline? uh, You know, the Bible talks about some of the translations describe him as reclining. You know, they ate and they visited in a reclining position in that culture. That's what they did. And it says that he was still reclining when he was told of his close and dear friend, Lazarus, you know, when he was told they were sick and dying. But he he didn't change his position even. He didn't do anything different. Um, so the question is, why did he still recline when he gets this terrible, terrible news about his great friend? Why didn't Yeshua or Jesus run to Lazarus to save his dear friend's life? We know he could. We know he was capable. Why did Yeshua wait specifically four days to show up? And why is it so important for us to believe in that spot where the cost of believing hurts so much? I don't know. You know, there may be people out there who have never been in a situation where... It costs them to believe. I said last week, and apparently I didn't realize this was a, a controversial statement, but I got a lot of comments from pastors and preachers and right reverends and whatnot all around the country and around the world saying that I was wrong to say the problem with Christianity now, the problem with faith now, is nobody's dying for it in America. I'm saying in America, nobody's dying for it. They said that's just uh, that's progress. That's not, you know, we're a developed nation. We don't we don't force people. Uh, to pay that kind of price, but by the end of tonight's message, you're gonna you're gonna get why they're wrong and I'm right. That's okay. What does any of this have to do with you? And 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 more than you can possibly imagine, it has to do with every single person of faith here, every single person of faith around the world that listens to this message. Um, it has to do with all of us. It really, really does. It definitely connects with every single person. So John 11, um, and I'm going to first read from the complete Jewish Bible. There was a man who had fallen sick. His name was Elazar, and he came from Bethania, which is Bethany. It's a Hebrew word, the actual name for Bethany. The village where Miriam and her sister Marta lived. This Miriam whose brother Eleazar had become sick, is the one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Remember that? You guys remember all that? So you need to understand what kind of friends these people were to Yeshua, or Jesus. You need to understand that these were his good, real friends. These were the friends of Yeshua that he was willing to stay in their house with, to eat with, to sit and talk all hours with, 
or to look at them and say, hey, you know what, I need to rest. I'm tired. <coughs> Let me go on and lay down and not feel bad about it. Now, I'm not going to kid you here, and it isn't become some foot. And let me, let me say this. And this is, I hope that you don't think that I'm bougie uh, or think high on myself. But I am no Jesus, obviously, not by a long shot. And I'm, and I'm not famous by any strap. But I am going to tell you this. There are a few, only a few places that I go to speak where I'll actually stay in someone's home overnight. I know that's strange because, you know, a lot of times, you know, people will invite you to stay. It saves money. It does all these things. You know, it gets you close to your people who are supporting what you're doing. But the thing is, um, but, and it isn't because some folks' homes aren't super nice, and really way nicer than my own home. Uh, they're beautiful, fancy, comfortable, clean, although some people's idea of clean is a little different than mine. But you see... I need doors, because of my background, I need doors that I can secure. I need to feel secure and calm in that place in order to sleep, to rest, to be able to proceed about the mission, whatever mission I'm on in that town. And if I stay at your home in my travels, then you know I feel close and comfortable with you in your home. And these people were those such people, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they were, they, they were those people. I mean, they supported the ministry of Yeshua and the Talmudim, and all the people that were clingers on to the Talmudim. I mean, there's a big crowd running around, you know. There was a lot going on. And so, anyway, while I go back to this, I'll get back to that. Mm-hmm. Verse 3, so the sisters sent a message to Yeshua. Lord, the man you love is sick. The disciples knew how much this guy Lazarus and his family means to him. That is why they set about telling him right away upon learning of it. On hearing it, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may receive glory through it. Now let me say this about that. That is an important word there. This sickness will not end in death. Now you have to understand that it, if, if we read on, and soon you will see it, he dies. Sorry to be the spoiler, but he dies. Lazarus dies. Elazar dies. <coughs> so he's dead. Right? Stuff happens to us, we die. Well, that's it. It's pretty much over. Yeshua loved Marta and her sister and Elazar so that when he heard he was sick, first he stayed where he was two more days. That's verse 5. Let's go back to the word end. This sickness will not end in death. Was Yeshua misinformed? Was he thinking maybe, eh, he probably won't die. He's going to be dying. He'll be all right. I believe. He has I have faith. He'll be fine. He's not going to die. Ah, let's stay here and eat. Let's stay reclined. Let's relax. I'm pretty comfortable here in this chair. Food's really good. Get some rest. I'm a little run down before we run over there to where he is in Bethany. So, we'll just chill out here. Because he's not going to die. Is that what happened? No. Now, I want to go back to this. Yeshua loved Marta and her sister and Eleazar. So, when he heard he was sick, first he stayed where he was two more days. Now, in order to fully understand this scripture, you have to realize that even though this response of Yeshua is staying two more days, Days seem so incongruent to Yeshua's friend's plight. I mean, he loves this guy. And they had a very special relationship. And that Yeshua, he was reclining when he was told this. His dear friend, oh, Lazarus, you know, his supporter, your great supporter, he's sick. and He's very sick, you know. He didn't stop reclining when he heard this terrible news. He didn't flinch. He didn't flinch. And it wasn't because, you know, you know, his response and his actions meant something. There was... There was something deeper going on here. But then he says, after this, verse 7, then after this, he said to the Talmudim, or the disciples, let's go back to Yehuda. Let's go back to Yehuda. Now, the Talmudim replied, Rabbi, just a short while ago, the Judeans were out to stone you, and you want to go back there? Well, A, they don't want to get stoned either, because if you're with Jesus, you're going to pay with your life. Right? They're not just throwing rocks. They weren't like uh, sniper rocks. You know, there's a bunch of rocks coming at you if you're near Jesus. 
you're going to get whacked in the head too. So I want to translate what they just said. Rabbi, just a short while ago, the Judeans were out to stone you, and you want to go back there? This is the modern language. This is what I would understand better. Maybe you understand that much better than I do. Uh, but this is my translation of what they actually meant by what they said. My teacher, you have got to be kidding me. Those whack jobs are trying to, they're out to pop a cap in you. They're trying to kill you. You want to go back there? Why do you want to go there? Let's stay as far as we can away from there. We don't need to be back up in there. Mm -mm. We'll stay up in here. It's nice. We're reclining. It's comfortable. We got the air on. You know, it's real nice. Yeshua answered, I probably didn't have the air on, I don't think. Conserve. They were very conserving people. Yeshua answered, aren't there 12 hours of daylight? If a person walks during the daylight, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if a person walks at night, he does stumble because he has no light with him. Now, Yeshua said these things, and afterwards he said to the Talmudim, or the disciples, our, our friend, Eleazar, or Lazarus, has gone to sleep. I am going in order to wake him up. Now, first of all, our, you got, you got to get this. This is important. Kind of hit me in the head like a four by four. I used to say two by four, but this one, you need, I need a brain injury. I need a little bigger. Hit me a little harder, a little bigger stick. Our friend. So the Talmudim are saying, what he's saying, what Yeshua is saying is, this is our friend. This is the this these are supporters of our ministry. These are people that we go and we hang out with. We eat food. They present us with food. All us here. We go rolling up into their town and we hang out with them and we stay with them. We sleep there and we eat there. And these people, these are our people. These are serious people. But he wasn't saying my friend. He was saying our friend. Our friend. Can you imagine being called a friend of Jesus. But I'm going in order to wake him up. Now the Talmudim said to him, Lord, if he is going to sleep, he will get better. Now Yeshua had, now, now let me just, let me give you, this is a tip here. They did not want to go to Yehuda. They did not want to go there. See, that's some of it. They're like, well, if he's asleep, but he'll wake up, he'll be fine. He'll be sleeping, you know. Lord knows we need plenty of rest. Nobody gets enough rest nowadays. Let him sleep. Let the boy go to sleep. He you know, works hard. But that wasn't it. If he is going to sleep, he will get better. Because they did not want to go there and get stoned them own selves. Now, Yeshua had used the phrase to speak about Eleazar's death, but they thought that he had been talking literally about sleep. So Yeshua told them in plain language. He broke it down for them. Eleazar has died. Do you see a verse there that says he died? Do you see any verse in the intervening that he died? Anybody? Me between. Between what? Between before now, what you just said. before and now. Yeah. No, there isn't one. There isn't one. It's after, but it's not before. So yes, we're told then in plain language, Eleazar has died, and for your sakes, I am glad that I wasn't there, so that you may come to trust. But let's go to him. Now, I want you to remember, so that you may come to trust. But let's go to him. Look, I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. Doesn't that sound weird? I would have liked to have been there. Now, let me tell you, I would have loved to have spent some time with Chris before he passed. I would have loved that. Honest to goodness. You know, I would have loved it. I would have hugged him, kissed him on his head. Told him how much I've loved him all these years. Thank you for remaining my friend. Thank you for being... And I would have prayed with him and all those things. We did pray on the phone some. Uh, but I would have loved that. And I just I just couldn't do it. I physically couldn't get there. And, and I couldn't even get there for the funeral. I was in too bad a shape. All that said to say this. I didn't need to go to Minnesota to build up Chris's faith that when he closed his eyes he would see Jesus. I didn't have to do that. Now, he had a different belief about it. He thought, you know, he's not going to get that glimpse of glory and all that stuff until his time, until Jesus comes back and all that stuff. And some people feel that. And some people, I, I'm okay with that. People believe differently. That's fine with me. He didn't need that. His faith was strong. So that you may come to trust. Now, I want you to understand who he is saying, who Yeshua is saying this to, are the men and the women who traveled with Yeshua all over the place, on foot, 
all over the place. And what did they see him doing? Healing people. People were blind. Now they're not blind anymore. People couldn't walk. They're walking, jumping, running around. They couldn't follow directions because he said, don't tell anybody. And then they went, first thing, told people. That's why I do that. I'm not going to lie to you. I pray for me. I would, I'd run to everybody I saw. Look here. I would dance. I'd jump up and down. Mm -mm. So that you may come to trust. These are people that traveled with Yeshua. They traveled with Jesus for three years. Remember, this is at the end, folks. What happens in a week or so? Yeah, right? But let's go to him. Then to Oma, the name means twin, said to his fellow Talmudim, another, to the other, other disciples, yes, we should go so that we can die with him. That's strong. We'll dig into that in a little bit. On arrival, Yeshua found that Eleazar had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, let's go back. Let's go back just for fun. Verse 14, what did I just say? So Yeshua told them in plain language, Eleazar has died. Nobody texted him to say, hey, well, you should have hurried up because, you know. No, he knew. He knew. He could feel it. Those are things he could feel. He was supernatural. He, he was and is divine. This, I mean, when you read this slower, it, it, it's powerful. You get all your money's worth out of this. On arrival, Yeshua found that Eleazar had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, all those who followed Jesus, they knew this. Now, these same people, let me go back, I want to say this, so that you may come to trust. Same people. I just want to, let's put that out there. Because even the the religious Rottweilers that were following Jesus, my sermon next week, if the Lord doesn't intervene, is, and then they sought how to kill him. I think that might be my title. We're going to kill him, or I'm going to i make it short somehow like the hashtag he gonna die and we gonna kill him that's too long the hashtag too hard to remember I'll figure something out but the point is that's what I'm gonna talk about these are the same people that traveled around peering into windows and stuff watching watching Yeshua heal people on Sundays oh you healed somebody on Sunday you worked you know they're just trying to trap him seeing somebody climb up on a roof and, and move away the thatch and with ropes, lowered their buddy down so that he would heal him. They were peering around, looking in the windows, and some of them were in there, watching, checking it out. These are the same people along with the Talmudim. So that you may come to trust. Now, these are the same people. These are the same people that knew Yeshua, Jesus Christ, raised others from the dead, the Tanakh reports that Eliehu, which is Elijah, and Elisha had raised people from the dead. You can read about that in 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24, 2 Kings 4, 17 through 37. But nowhere in the Bible, or secular history for that matter, was there anyone deceased for four days to the point where, let's be honest, let's be real, stank. There was some sure stank <laughs> rising up out of there. There's no record of, of anyone being raised from the dead. The incident is reported in such a way that nobody misses its significance. Yeshua has physically brought back to life a four days dead, cold, stinking corpse. And this miracle crowns Yeshua's ministry prior to his own death and resurrection. That is what produced the profound reaction among the populace and the authorities reported in the rest of this in the following chapter. You need to understand this well before we move even an inch forward because four days... That's one day past the time where the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, religious Rottweilers would believe restoration to life could happen. Even God, even that God could do. Four days was one day too many. There was a reason Yeshua waited four days and not three or two or one. There's a reason he went there in person instead of healing him from from afar, from where he was in the recline, he could have just done whatever, whatever made whatever move he wanted to make. He could have done whatever he wanted to do. He didn't have to do anything. He could. He didn't even have to wrinkle his nose. He could just think it to the father. Father, you know, please heal him. I, it's comfortable. I'm getting good food. The olives are great. I'm just going to stay here. I'm tired. What with dying next week and all, I'm going to be busy. Verse 18. Now, Beit Anya was, which is Bethany, remember, two miles from Yerushalayim. It's two miles from Jerusalem. 
And many of the Judeans had come to Martha and Miriam in order to comfort them at the loss of their brother. Now, you've got to understand this. Um, how many have ever sat Shiva? Anybody ever sat Shiva? I've sat Shiva. I was invited to do it. I'm not Jewish, but I was invited to do it. I had a Jewish family. You've got to understand what this means. There's this large crowd that come to sit Shiva with the family. The family's not left alone. You're not left alone for seven days, typically it's seven days. You're not left alone. Uh, you're ministered to. You greet the people. There's mourners outside. There's mourners inside. You're, you're making a show of how important this person was to you and your community and your family and all these things. So this, this family meant something to all these people. I mean, they, this large crowd is gathering. These are well-known people, wealthy enough to afford to actually have an extra room. I talked a little bit about it last week. Wealthy enough to be able to feed a whole bunch of Talmudim. And those people can eat. If you know anything about disciples, those folks can eat. You know, they're walking everywhere. I mean, no kidding. It sounds funny, but they're walking everywhere. They're hungry. I'd be hangry. In that kind of heat, 127 degrees, I'd be hangry. I'm like, Lord, we got to stop. We got to get us something to drink, nice and cold. And I need to get something more than just bread. This pita bread is nice and a little wild, but I got to put some good stuff in it. You know, I got to rest, find me some shade, maybe a pool, land, something. That's just not, that's not how it works here. So many people love this man, Lazarus, and his family. This was a family of significant means. The ones, these are, remember, these are the ones, I don't want this to escape out of your head. These are the ones that Yeshua felt comfortable enough going and staying over as he traveled in and around this area uh, to have meals. These were his real friends. These were his real people. Verse 20. So when Marta heard that Yeshua was coming, she went out to meet him. But Miriam continued sitting Shiva in the house. Now, why? Because Miriam probably felt, what's the use? I'm going to stay here and sit Shiva. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave. I'm just going to sit Shiva here. And because Lazarus is gone, he's dead. He's graveyard dead. So Martha said to Yeshua, this, don't, don't miss this. This is too good. Martha said to Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here. Now, every time I had read this before in my whole life, my whole life, 50 plus, how old am I? 52. 52. 50 how many? 52. I'll be 53, that means, next birthday. I'm a mathematician. I don't like to brag. I don't like to show off. I've got a math teacher here. I just go on and brag. I did that right in my head. Martha said to Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here. You want to know how I read it for 50 years? How many? 52 years. Almost 53. If you had, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. I always read it like that. Instead of, I read it this way, and this is what smacked me in the head, like I need another head injury, but the Lord will fix it. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, Martha, she wasn't devoid of faith in Yeshua's supernatural power. She knew he was supernatural. That's why... That's why, you know, they made meals and they anointed his feet with their hair and the expensive oil and all these things. That's why they did that. They said, this is the guy. Oh, and by the way, he's our friend. This is the guy. He stays. Do you know Jesus stays at our house? Did you all know that? He stays at our house. Yeah. Yeah. When he comes through, he stays. The guy that heals people, raises people, he stays at our house. Chills with us. People do not do that with me when I stay at their house. They're like, whew, love of Jesus. That guy's weird. Let him go. But she had this faith. She had this faith in his supernatural power. She wasn't devoid of, of, of this faith. It was the opposite. What I think is so cool here is she immediately and directly engaged him because of her faith. And she linked it proximally to the healing. She said, if you'd have been... We're going to talk. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go on back. Verse 23. Yeshua said to her, your brother will rise again. Love this response. Mark said, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Somebody did their study in Sunday school. Flannel grass, I'm sure she paid attention. She paid attention to the flannel grass. Up there, this is what happened in the enemy rise in the last day. This is what can happen. She knew. She knew. She did her memory verses, got her candy and all that. She knew her scripture. She knew in whom 
She believed, she trusted on that day, Lazarus would rise with those saints in the grave. She was resolved to wait, but she made her feelings known to Yeshua because they were dear friends. This is what Yeshua said to her. This is strong. I misread this my whole life, too. I could genuinely be stupid, but I got it this time. A little slow. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever puts his trust in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone living and trusting in me will never die. Do you believe this? I'm going to go back to this in a second. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Now, let me go back. Let me go back. I can't, stand, I can't stand not to go back. When I used to play tennis with my buddy Phil McKelvey in Memphis, he used to take advantage of me because I couldn't, I couldn't not go back. We would have like two or three cans of tennis balls, right? And we'd beat them to death because we didn't have any money. Um, so we'd use the same ones. You know, they lose their pop. Well, instead of keeping on playing, if one hit the net, if I was rushing the net on a play, I would try to combine the leaning over and picking up the ball, stuffing it in my pocket, and hitting the ball and trying to win the point or keeping the rally. I know, it's crazy. He knew that, so he would try to hit the ball near the ball that was just kind of laying dead in the court. He knew that and took advantage of it. So that's probably how I developed this need to go back, but I'm going to do it just for fun. Don't cost you any extra. I want you to get this because this is strong. Martha said to Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she sang. She sang by this. Look, I know that we're all going to rise again, you know, in the last day, all this. I, I know that. But if you'd been here, if you would have, I believe that just you being here, proximally, here, he wouldn't have died. She doesn't say, if you'd have been here and said, don't die, or heal him. She said, if you'd have been here, the presence of Jesus is more powerful than you could ever imagine even in your heart. Yeshua says to her, your brother will rise again. And she acknowledges, she studied, remember she got the candy, paid attention to the final graph, she got her memory verse, got her stars. I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But then Yeshua says, he changes the whole framing of time and space, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I want you to understand that she deserves another star, because if you go back and look at it, if you go back and look at it, she acknowledges that if you were here, in other words, space and time, you were in this place at that time, he wouldn't have died. But he says, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever puts, not who put, past tense. Not who will put, but who puts. If you put, if you put your trust in me, once you do that and you believe, you will live. goes from the physical Jesus to the faith in Jesus. I don't know if that hits you like it hit me, but y'all, that was strong. And everyone living and trusting in me will never die. Do you believe this? I love how Yeshua doesn't give people an out. Decide and if you don't decide, that's a decision. He says, do you believe this? He doesn't say, do you believe me? He says, do you believe this? She says to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Now this is clear. 
This is concise, direct faith, unapologetically stated, in the shadow of the very grave of Lazarus, her dear Lazarus, decomposing and stinking. Even in the shadow of death, she believed. She just didn't know the timing. She didn't understand how Yeshua and the Father's timing works. And you know what? This occurred to me, neither do we. Neither do we. We don't. We don't understand the timing of Christ and that of Nihilahim. We don't understand. Because why? We are people that want it now. We're the people that set the mic. Well, let me read the box here and see what I don't cook no microwave, so this is, I'm making this up from what I've seen on TV. Because I don't use a microwave, I don't know how. No kidding. Pre crash, I couldn't either. Uh, one minute. Is this an even accurate time? One minute and 23 seconds. So, right, you would cook something for one minute and 23 seconds. One minute and 23 seconds, right? We're standing there, we're watching it. It gets to 51 seconds, we're like, that's good enough. That's, that's close enough. Boop. Pull the door open, we're done, right? That's because we're that kind of people. We're the kind of people that we want to see it now. We want to see it plain. We want to see the map. We want to see around the corners. We want to see what's coming. We want to see how it's coming. We want to have every explanation provided to us. But but this dear woman says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. This is, the, you know, these people have strong faith. They're real people of faith. But they don't get it. And they've seen this is three years, folks. Plus, they probably knew all about him when he was a kid and all stories get around. You know, uh, they, they know all about him. They know what's happened. He's been in their house. All of these things, they know, they know. And she says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming to the world. She's making this statement out loud. Do you understand what that could have gotten her? In that, in that culture and in that time? Because the religious Rottweilers were, were wanting to beat down everybody who who agreed with this guy. You're not the Messiah. You're the Messiah? No. No. Even then, she acknowledged him. In the shadow of the death of her brother, she acknowledged him. So after this, verse 28, I better get going. I didn't realize what time it was. After saying this, she went off and secretly called Miriam her sister. I love this. I love this. She says, the rabbi is here and is calling for you. I want you to understand what's happening here. I don't know if, I don't think they did time out back then. For the radio audience, I'm sorry to mess this up. One hand, preferably left. I don't know if anybody does it like this. Uh, maybe it's just I'm right-handed, but left hand straight in a blade, finger straight out, thumb tucked in. Other hand just like that, except you put it over top and you go like this, like the football timeout. That's what I'm. This he. I don't think he said this, but maybe he did. Maybe he just did like this, or maybe he just held his hand up. Whatever he did, I don't know what he did, but I know this. He interrupted and said, "Go get your sister. The rabbi is here, and is calling." For you. This next verse will freak your freak. It's going to blow your mind. When she heard this, she jumped up and went to him. She was sitting shiva, somber, mourning, dark, crying. Sends the sister, go get your sister. Go get your sister. Upon hearing the rabbi, the teacher, Jesus, Yeshua, he's calling for you. She jumps up. I don't know if I'm going to go anywhere. I don't know if I'm going anywhere. You know what? He could have come here. He could have come here. Four days ago, he could have come here. Wouldn't have been doing all this mess, making all this food, people coming up in here, bringing this food. You know we don't want to eat. Sitting shiva. I don't even know this person. Sitting up here in my house full of people. Wouldn't have had to even wouldn't have had to even do all this. You know he can heal. You know he can heal. She didn't do that. When she heard that Jesus is calling, she jumped up. 
She jumped up. And she went to him. He's calling for you. He's calling for me. He's calling for anyone who has an ear to hear. I'm calling for you. But we don't jump up. And we don't go to him. We hem and we haul. Yeshua had not yet come into the village. I want you to understand. You've got to hear this. You've got to hear this now. If you skipped over this before, shame on you, shame on me, because I did too. Yeshua had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met. That girl had to run from outside of the village. Girls don't be running in Hebrew. No, they don't run. But she went. She had to come get her sister. Come on. Yeshua had not yet come to the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Judeans who had been with Miriam in the house, remember these, they're grieving, sitting, shut in the house, comforting her, saw her get up quickly and go out, they followed her. Whoo, what's the girl getting up for? We're in Shiva. You're supposed to be quiet. If you've ever been sitting in Shiva or been, you know, stopped on the outside of the house, give your condolences to a Jewish person. You know it's not a bunch of crazy business. There's a lot of quiet talking. Like, oh, what are they dying of? Oh, you whisper that. You know, you don't say that out loud. Whatever they died of, you know, whatever. They, and they, they, later on, you see, he says, what did he die of? This just might happen. I don't know if this is recorded. What did he die of? Jesus wouldn't come. That's why he died. Jesus wouldn't come. There's fact in that. They followed her. They saw her jump up and they followed her. What in the what's going on? Where's she going? Let's follow her. In this culture, you're not left alone to mourn. You're not by yourself. They don't leave you be. You're always accompanied. Now they thought she was going to the tomb to mourn some more. I want to go be near. So let's go with her. We don't want this girl to be alone. When Miriam, this is verse 32, if you keep in count, when Miriam came to where Yeshua was and saw him. Now, don't miss this, because I've missed this all these years. She went all the way back to where Yeshua was. She fell at his feet. Understand that that's worship. Even in this dark time in her life, she worshiped, she fell at her feet fell at his feet, and said to him, Lord, if you had been here again, again, not if you had been here and healed him, if you'd have been here. A simple process. Understand what they're testifying to, the power of Christ. They're testifying, if you'd have been here in this place, if you'd have been here in my heart, truly in my heart. If you'd have truly been here, this is what I'm saying, this is what you might be saying. If you'd have been here, my life would not be wrecked. I wouldn't be in a ditch right now. I wouldn't be in this situation right now. I wouldn't have this going on in my life. This hurt, habit, habit. I, I read this. I read this uh, today, and it, it drives me crazy. Because I have friends, first responders, and, and this drives me crazy. So over the weekend, 14 people overdosed in Sussex County alone on heroin. 14. If Jesus is here in your heart, you ain't overdosing on no heroin because you don't need it. I have friends that have big businesses. I won't say where they are, but it's a big business, big company. They pay well. They treat their employees well. You're going to work hard, but you're going to get paid well. And you'll be treated with dignity and respect. No matter what they offer, they can't find anybody. Why? Because most of the people don't want to come work. They want to go rob houses and rob cars. Why? Because they want to get money for heroin and crystal meth. This is nuts, folks. This is absolutely insane. There's not a person alive outside of a mental incapacity that doesn't know that you cook something in a spoon or however you do it, you draw it up in a hypodermic needle, and you stick that sucker in your arm, it's going to end one of two ways. You're going to die, or it's going to wreck you and everything that you love. I'm using that as an example, but how many other things? How many other hurts, habits, and hang-ups 
are wrecking people around this country today. Radio audience, I'm pointing at my heart when I say, if you, Lord, if you'd have been here, I wouldn't have gone through this. The difference is, is from then until now, we have to invite him. He knocks. He stands at the door and he knocks. Do we let him in? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. To Miriam, all it would have taken for Yeshua to heal Lazarus is the simple issue of location, proximity. That is incredible faith. She also is saying, here, your presence here, your presence in this problem, modern people, your presence in this sorrow, modern people, your presence in this grief, modern people, your presence in this time of confusion, modern people. If he's here, you can move forward and through that thing that you're suffering. All he's got to be is in you. And you're the one that does the invite. Now, verse 33. When Yeshua saw her crying and also the Judeans who came with her crying, he was deeply moved and also troubled. Something troubled him about that. Something troubled him about all the... She's crying and the Judeans are there and they're crying and they're, they're upset and... And he was moved, but he was troubled. And he says immediately, where have you buried him? I want you to understand that Yeshua knew where he was buried. Didn't know how, he didn't have to ask questions. He's the, he's the supernatural GPS. He didn't have to ask any questions. He didn't have to ask anything. He was just going, let me run over here and handle some business for you right quick. Pull your Instagram account up, do a video, do a Facebook Live. But he says, he asks a question, where have you buried him? They said, Lord, come and see. Now, we all love this memory verse as a little kid. Verse 35, Yeshua cried, Jesus wept. One verse. Not Jesus wept, comma, and then he. Not Jesus wept, comma, so the Judeans there said. Not Jesus wept, comma, anything else. It was in its own place. Two words. The shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Yeshua cried. Verse 36, so the Judeans there said, see how he loved him. Some of them said, "Mm, folks got to get like this. You know I told you it was coming. Don't act surprised. But some of them said, He opened a blind man's eyes. Couldn't he have kept this one from dying? Straight up and for real, that's what they said. Probably didn't say it like that. He opened the blind man's eyes. Couldn't he have kept this one from dying? Always complain. You know what? This was different. This was different than Miriam and Marta. This was different. They said if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But they're saying, this blind guy running around can see now. Couldn't even kept this one from dying. Mm-mm. They went. They went around that whole. You're the answer, and they made it. You're the problem. You're the problem. How many of us, at different points in our lives, have looked at God and said, mm, "You're the problem. You're the problem." Yeshua again. This is verse thirty-eight. Deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying in front. Of the entrance. Now, let me just put this out. Please tell me you you haven't missed this. Do you not see the signi- the terribly, wonderfully amazing, significant correlation to what we in the modern age know now? Because we have the book that tells us what happened. Similar to this, just a little while later. Please tell me that I haven't missed. He's at the grave. He's outside the grave. There's a stone, and there's not one person that's going to move that stone. There's a bunch of folk that are going to move the stone. In this case, human beings are going to move the stone. 
I don't believe anybody touched that stone but God. I don't believe anybody touched that stone when just a little while later, Yeshua was to come forth, resurrected. I don't think anybody had touched that stone. But this one, somebody got to do something. Somebody got to take an action. Listen, I said this to somebody this week. The Lord will not heal something. The Lord will not fix something. The Lord will not write something that you can fix yourself. He won't do it. He will not do it. He gives us power to do things. He gives us the gumption, the mental capacity. Okay, if I don't want to get, in my case, overweight, then i got to push myself back from that ice cream cake. It's not my last meal. That gum. You don't have to have a piece this big. I did have, now let me be honest. I'm going to confess. Um, I did have a lot of food tonight. Y'all that were here will say, amen, that stuff was good. And I'm not going to lie to you and act like I might not possibly have more. I'm just saying. Just putting that out there. Pray for it. So action needs to be taken. So what does Yeshua says in verse 39? Yeshua says, take the stone away. There's an exclamation point there. He's not saying, take the stone away. I, look, I love Jim. Who knows who Jim Caviezel is, right? Played Yeshua in uh, Passion of the Christ. He played... Luke in the Apostle Paul. Who on here has watched that? Oh, bawled my eyes out. You see at the end, the little girl that he, that he tortured before Christ appeared to him, the Apostle Paul, when he gets beheaded and he's walking, and uh, he's, he's in eternity, and this little girl and those that he persecuted come up to him and smile at him and welcome him. Bawled like a baby. Yeshua said, Take the stone away. That's my only beef with Jim Caviezel. He's a little... You got, you know, but is there an exclamation point? The Lord yelled it. He raised his voice. It wasn't feminine. I, I like the guy. He's amazing. Amazing man of faith, but he didn't whisper stuff. He yelled it. Take the stone away. I note that Yeshua does not say, hey, how about you roll that stone away a tiny little bit so we can see if he's actually dead. No, he says, take it away. We won't need it. You're not going to need this grave, so you don't need to leave it nearby. Take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the dead man. Not the maybe dead. The dead man said to Yeshua, By now his body must smell, for it has been four days since he died. Yeshua said to her, Didn't I tell you that if you keep trusting you will see the glory of God. He didn't say, if you keep trusting, you're going to see me do fantastic things, amazing things. You're going to see me do it. I'm going to do it right now. Keep trusting. I'm going to do it right now. Keep watching me. Watching me. See, that's where we get all jacked up. Once we get a little movement in our ministry, we start saying, take a look at me. No, don't take a look at me. Don't look at me. You do not want to look at me. Look at God. Yeshua was perfect, and he didn't say, look at me. Look at me. He said, look at God. Didn't I tell you, if you keep trusting, you will see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Yeshua looked upward and said, now why did he look upward? Because he's about to pray. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I myself know that you always hear me, but I say this because of the crowd standing around so that they may believe that you have sent me. Now, you don't think they were listening? You don't think they're listening hearing him pray? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm praying to you, Father, out loud here so that they may see that you have sent me, so that you may believe that you have sent me. Having said this, he shouted, Eleazar, come out! The man who had been dead came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and his face covered with a cloth. Yes, was said to them, unwrap him! And let him go. I'm going to tell you something. Now, I died in my crash. You all know that. I didn't know it. I didn't know it for how many years. We didn't know. So one of the firemen who said I was dead did my vitals, and the fireman with him did my vitals. They said, oh, he gone. Double failed. We didn't know it. And no, I didn't have some experience, near-death experience. I didn't have that. I wish I did, but I didn't. But it's okay that I didn't, because I, that's all I would ever talk about, for real. Lord knows, you know, if I give him some vision, he's never going to shut up about it. So he didn't give me a vision. 
I'm not saying I'm bitter, but I would have liked a little something. The man who had been dead came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen, his face covered with a cloth. Yeshua said to him, listen, you need to understand, wrapped. Right? What did they bring to the tomb for Jesus? 70 pounds of spices. And they put that all on you and they wrap you and put more and wrap you again, put more. You're a mummy. For real mummy. I don't know how he came out. Like a penguin a little bit. Maybe they didn't do all of his feet. I don't know. Maybe he hopped. I don't know. How do you even know where he was going? He just went toward the voice of the one who would never lead us astray. Unwrap him and let him go. At this, many of the Judeans who had come to visit Miriam had seen what Yeshua had done and they trusted in him. Here's what's crazy about this statement. We say, Lord, show me a miracle. I just said it just now. I didn't get a near-death experience. I saw a flash. I think I remember saying, "Uh uh-oh. I didn't know the lights were out. But then I remember looking around and feeling a lot of pain. And I thought to myself, it ain't going to be long now. It ain't going to be long now. Little did I know I had already been there and come back. It ain't going to be long now because nobody hit me head on at that kind of closing speed where I don't, I had some skills, y'all. I knew I could avoid most crashes. I couldn't avoid this one. I knew that closing speed was high speed. I knew I'm probably not far from the end. Little did I know I'd already been there and back. These people had seen Yeshua working for three years. And they still didn't fully At this, many of the Judeans who had come to visit Miriam and had seen what Jesus had done, Yeshua had done, trusted in him. Sometimes that's what it takes. Don't you wish we didn't need to have that big experience? Don't you think that that diagnosis, don't you think that losing a dear friend like Chris and and, and Eric and brother and all these different things. Sometimes sometimes we need to be smacked up on our head. I'm trying to get you to pay attention, the Lord says. I'm trying to get you to turn toward me, the Lord says. Verse 46. But some of them went off to the Prashim and Pharisees and all. Told them what he had done. So the head Kohanim, or the, the big guy, the guy with the big hat, and the Prashim called a meeting of the Sanhedrin rulers and said, What are we going to do? For this man is performing many miracles. Oy, this guy with the miracles all the time. If we let him keep going on his way, everyone will trust him and the Romans will come and destroy both the temple and nation. Now let me say this. They said that. They said that. Yes, they did say that. They, they did add on. And the Romans will come and destroy both the temple and the nation. So let me tell you what was the little underlying thing. Y'all, we make some good coin off of these people, following every little thing we say. We get them to obey, get them to do whatever we want. We got power. We got authority. This guy comes along healing people. None of us ever done that. We haven't healed anybody. Haven't healed anybody blind. Haven't healed anybody couldn't walk. Haven't healed anybody that, that died. We have never done that. We can't compete with that. If we keep... Oh, if we let him keep going... On his way, everyone will trust him. If we let him keep, if we let him, what do we hear? I said it last week. Y'all that kept notes, I said it last week. Pilate said to him, don't you know I'm the one who can take your life? I would have chuckled if it were me. That's why they didn't make me Jesus. I would have chuckled. I would have said, come on, ninja, please. You don't control anything I do. The father does. You don't. You better get real. I would have done that and that would have been, it wouldn't have written as well. But one of them, 
Caiapha said, Caiapha, who was the Kohen Gadol that year, high priest, said to them, you people don't know anything. You don't see that it is better for you if one man dies on behalf of the people so that the whole nation won't be destroyed. Now, don't miss this. John 12, 1 through 12. I don't know if I'll read all. Six days before Pesach or the Passover, Yeshua came to Bethania, which is Bethany, where Eleazar, Lazarus, lived. The man Yeshua had raised from the dead. All right? About a week, what are we, about a week later? Six days before the, okay, here we go. Where Eleazar lived, the man Yeshua had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner there in his honor. Martha served the meal, and Eleazar was among those reclining at the table with Yeshua. Ooh. He's chilling with Jesus. When just a little while before, Jesus was taking a lot of heat for still reclining. When he gets told about his friend, I got this. It'll be okay. Chill a little bit. Have faith a little bit. It'll be okay. You're not going to know the time of when it's going to be fixed, but guess what? I'm going to handle it. I'm going to handle it. It's going to, you're going to be all right. Lazarus, I would have done this. This is me. That's why I didn't make me Jesus. Lazarus, Somebody in the room has been raised from the dead here in the past week. I would love for you to raise your hand. The, the person who was, the people who have been raised from the dead by me and the Father, raise your hand in the past week. And just in the past week. Lazarus would have been like, woo. Right? I didn't raise both hands. He's reclining, he's having a meal. With the man who breathed life in him through a stone. He was stinking in the grave four days dead. Graveyard dead. And now he's sitting there eating with the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he knows it. We better act like we know who we believe in. We better act like we know in whom we believe, in whom we trust. We better trust in whom we believe in. Miriam took a whole pint of pure oil of spikenard, which is very expensive, poured it on uh, Yeshua's feet and wiped his feet with her hair so that the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of the Talmudim, Yehuda from Kiriot, Judas Iscariot, the one who was about to betray him said, this perfume is worth a year's wages. Why hadn't it been sold and the money given to the poor? Now, let me say this. The verse says this. I would have said it differently. Now, he said this not out of concern for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he was in charge of the common person used to st- and he used to steal from it. Yeshua said, leave her alone. She kept this for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. A large crowd of Judeans learned that he was there. And they came not only because of Yeshua, but also so that they could see Eleazar, whom he had raised from the dead. This is six days away from where this man was dead, and now he's alive. And they say, did you hear? Did you hear about this? You remember Lazarus? He was dead. Stinky, graveyard, four days dead, he was dead, and now he's over there. You want to go see him? Oh, you know I'm going to go see him. I'm going to go up and see him. I'm going to go see him. I don't smell any dead on him. He looks pretty good. Talking and eating. Sometimes, my friends, there's a cost for following Christ because the very next verse, verse 10, the head Kohanim then decided to do away with Eleazar too. They now decided to not just do away with Jesus, but they now wanted to do away with Yeshua's dear friend whom he had raised from the dead. Sometimes it costs you to follow someone's teaching. If Lazarus hadn't died, Yeshua hadn't healed him, then the plot to crucify the Lord would not have come to be and we would not have salvation. Since it was because of him, the large numbers of Judeans were leaving their leaders and putting their trust in Yeshua. Sometimes it will cost you because people will look at you. The next day, the large crowd had come 
for the festival, heard that Yeshua was on his way to Jerusalem. Listen, Jerusalem or Jerusalem. Listen, people, when they hear, when they hear, when you tell a story about what God did for you, and you tell it, tell it. Not apologetically, not sheepishly, but you tell it. He healed me from this. He's healing me from that. You know, I have a problem with this or that thing. I'm not going to name a bunch of things, but people got hurts, habits, and hang-ups. They're real stuff. You tell people, he's healing me from this. He's protecting me from this. He has raised me from this. I used to have a bad problem with this, but he's helping me with this. And you know, sometimes I mess up, but he's back in the game. He helps me out. As soon as I, when did, when did Kepha fall? When did Peter fall into the water? When he turned his eyes away from Yeshua. But we tell our story and we say, this is the man. That guy right there. Come on up in here. That guy right there. I was dead in a grave. And he healed me. I was addicted to drugs. And he released me. I was addicted to sorrow. And he released me. I was addicted to grief. And he released me. I was addicted to feeling sorry for myself. And he released me. I was addicted to negativity. And he released me. I was addicted to hopelessness. And he released me. That guy. Right there. The difference is, previously in the story, folks, I said what Miriam and Marta said, if you'd have been here, the death wouldn't have happened. And for the radio audience, I'm pointing at my heart. If you'd have been here, that thing wouldn't have happened. You say, well, bad stuff happens to good people. I'm telling you right now, I understand now more fully than ever there's a cost for following Christ. The harder you follow, the harder the cost. I'm telling you right now, it's the truth. We are not going to be, we don't get a free pass. It's going to be, it's going to be tough sometimes. Sometimes way tougher than others. The Yazidi Christians do not deny Heavenly Father. And they die because of it. By the thousands. And yes, it is still going on today. Sometimes. There is a cost for following Christ. The question is, does anyone even know that you follow Christ? Dr. Greer returns next Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And in the meantime, he'll be working to restore your freedom and your liberty. He will engage in the collision of faith and politics for you and with you. In the meantime, remember to follow him on Twitter at The Ninja Pastor and follow him on Facebook. Dr. Greer's controversial book, Excellence Killed the Church, How Mediocrity is Destroying America, is available on Amazon and at other fine booksellers. Or you can get a copy directly through his website, www.drshawngreener.com, where you can also listen to interviews and speeches and messages free of charge. Show archives are available on iTunes through drshawngreener.com.